do what the the ludo narrative and dead space thing again yes okay well i guess that's good enough considering we are going to be starting there anyway that's pretty much all the introductions out of the way but yeah like boulder if you feel free to raise your hand uh there is no bathroom pass this is a college course you just leave so keep that in mind and again if you have a question those are allowed feel free to raise your hand if if the spirit moves you so to speak and let's begin this is ludo narrative in dead space or how i learned to stop worrying and love throwing sharp objects at high velocity now first things first the terms of engagement or what are you talking about there are a couple terms that are very academic very gamey very smart very games journalism e that we do need to get out of the way so that this conversation makes sense to people who aren't gamer brained like me so here are the three most important ones ludology the study of play that is pretty simple as far as things go as far as definitions that's that's how it is it is the study of play what it's like how people react to it how it's made all that sort of jazz right narrative as we are going to define it for this lecture is the events themes and or messaging of a text or piece of media when i was actually taking the class this was one of the class days where we sat down and tried to define narrative narrative is a lot of things but this is one of the generalized definitions that we decided on and it's the one that will be helping us understand this going forward Ludo narrative, then, as you might be able to see by the combination of the terms in a physical sense, the intersection between gameplay and narrative, or how do the gameplay and story interact with one another, right? So, as I said, this is going to be a conversation, or a lecture rather, regarding Ludo narrative in dead space. So, now that we understand the terms we're going to be using going forward, we can move on to the games we are going to be applying them to. Key players, key information. Dead Space 1. Isaac Clark, silent engineer and repair technician, is sent on a mission to the planet-cracking mining ship, the USG Ishimura. Necromorphs, which can be generally understood as space zombies, attack, leaving Isaac fighting to survive as he searches for a way to stop them, right? And then Dead Space 2 rolls along. Isaac Clark, traumatized engineer and repair technician, has been in an asylum on the space station Aegis 7 for three years following the events of the first game. Necromorphs attack again, leaving Isaac fighting to survive again as he searches for a way to escape and stop the Necromorphs for real this time. We are all going to be collectively ignoring Dead Space 3, but something we can't ignore is that there are a few genre distinctions between these two games. So, the first game, Dead Space, is firmly in the camp of survival horror, which is to say that it has a lot of mechanics regarding resource management in a tense situation where you're going to constantly have to spend those resources in order to survive with, as the name might imply, horror theming, right? Dead Space 2, on the other hand, as tends to happen with most horror properties, is more of an action survival or survival action genre game, or at least that's what I have been referring to it, to, to it as, rather. Now, the key distinction there is given that it leaned more heavily into action, Isaac as a character became far more capable and his moveset became a lot faster, a lot more fluid, and a lot more deadly, right? And those are important things to keep in mind for the conversation going forward, is that while Dead Space 1 was survival horror and it was dealing primarily in the language of disempowerment and empowerment through mastery over mechanics, Dead Space 2 is an action game. And so there's going to be a lot of elements there that are meant to empower you from the jump and are meant to feel very fun, right? So the mission, or what's the point of it all? We are going to compare various introductory elements and scenes between Dead Space 2 and Dead Space 1. And we're going to examine how these scenes specifically characterize Isaac through his tools and how the player is taught to use them. What does this thing do and why? For this purpose, I have a couple videos set up. These are going to be the larger portion of what this lecture is. We're going to be watching these videos, and we are going to analyze the elements within them, right? And so here's generally what every video, is, or I say every, there are only two of them. Here's what the videos are going to be compri comprised of. We have an introduction, which shows Isaac's first encounter with Necromorphs in the game. We have him acquiring his first weapon, which is going to be the plasma cutter in both games. 
We have him acquiring the tool of stasis. We have him acquiring the tool of kinesis. And then we have one encounter in each game that just so happens to feature three necromorphs, just to give you a general idea of how a normal standard engagement goes in each game. So with that in mind, first, for, first thing that's up, first things first, is the Dead Space 1 video. Look good. He's taking a lot of damage. The trans system's offline. Getting around's gonna be difficult. The air seems to be flowing again. That's a start. What the hell was that? Automatic quarantine must have tripped from the filtration system we started. Everybody relax. What was that? Did you hear that? Not sure. What the hell? I don't know. Something's in the room with us. Okay, we're back. Are we back? Okay, awesome. Great. I'm back. I'm disconnected again. We're going to just close that up, share my share my screen. Games is lit. Resolution, we're going to go with crisp 720p. And hopefully that that is better. Hopefully that does it. And we'll be good and everything will be fine now and there will be no more technical difficulties we have to struggle through. So, do we have visual I'm going to assume that we have visual. You can see the cursor. Okay, we're good. We're good then. All right. Let's just go back a little bit again. This time for sure.
Tower is malfunctioning, Isaac. Try using the stasis module you just picked up. All right, so now here are some questions to ponder and also a little short time for some more basic discussion before the larger one takes place. Did the ragdoll get any laughs in class? Boulder, the entire reason I am presenting this is because I slept through the class where I would have gotten to present this in the first place. So I don't know if it got any laughs. I've had much worse ragdolls. So questions to ponder or what did I just watch? How does Isaac react to danger? How does Isaac acquire his tools? How does the game teach you how to use them? And how do these elements influence Isaac's characterization? Now, what did you folks see? What were you guys able to notice about the tools that Isaac was giving and the situations that he was in? Slang, you raising your hand? What am I talking about? Let's see. In the, in the tutorial section, when the necromorphs are introduced, you are behind a pane of glass, unable to interfere or interact with the enemies. You've just demonstrated their deedlessness while friendly NPCs get torn to shreds. Uh, you don't have any tools to defend yourself and are forced to flee from the enemies. Further disempowerment. After a brief chase, you are given a weapon along with a diegetic tutorial on how to use it. Cut off their limbs. Then, before presenting the first fightable enemy, the game makes you interact with the world via kinesis, opening a door. Then, immediately after the first ever instance of combat, the game teaches you how to use stasis to get through a glitched door. Then follows more combat with a group of slow-moving enemies. Yeah, so not quite in that order. And the first thing that, honestly, this is something that I didn't even pick up on, is yes, in order to actually get to that first fight, you need to figure out how to use the gun in the first place. I did try a couple of times to see if I could punch the fuse box, right? And... In Dead Space 2, you are able to punch fuse boxes, but in that first encounter there, you have to shoot it, which is a way of the game teaching you how to use the tool that you've just been given. Can I slid this? Oh, man. You're actually... Oh, okay, cool. You guys are actually taking notes. Nice. Uh, Isaac is shown running away. He is not even considering fighting uh, enemies. He is encountered with a laser cutter and is using it as a weapon against a single necromorph succeeded. Uh, further into the ship, Isaac finds a stasis module that allows him to pass through broken doors. Once again, Isaac finds another module to aid him, the kinesis module. Nice. Okay, cool. Nice. In Dead Space 1, he's kind of hunched back. Yes, that is... He's a little shrimp. He's more than a little shrimp. How does Isaac react to danger? He doesn't. Okay. Interesting. Uh, let's see. Now, 
are there any ways that you noticed in which Isaac acquiring these tools characterizes him in some way? An important thing to consider, especially as it relates to ludology, is that when you have been playing games for a long time, the tendency is to take a lot of mechanics or interactions for granted, right? You are, when you understand the language of games, you get into the mindset of knowing, okay, this is a tool that I've been given, and as the player, you understand, I get this tool, this is how I use it, right? But it's also important to consider the narrative circumstances under which that weapon or tool is acquired, right? And so, with that in mind, and with these questions on your mind as well, we're going to move to Dead Space 2 to expand the discussion. Are, are we back? Okay, cool. Great. Love some technical difficulties. Video is back. All right. We're going to hope it doesn't happen again, and that's the last time for certain. Good, good. Steady, steady, steady. We got to get you out of this straitjacket. Where, where am I? All right. I, I know you're confused right now, but I can explain everything, but you got to trust me, okay? Listen. You're in terrible, terrible danger. Are you a doctor? Calm down. I'll cut you out of there. Is that a tissue laser? A plasma cutter? Oh my god! Fuck. What the fuck are you oh, doing? Shit. Help! I'm trying! I'm trying! I'm trying!
All right, and that was Dead Space 2. Now, important to consider, the events shown in this, aside from the fight at the end, it's just an example of the you know standard combat loop, everything in there occurs in chronological order, which is to say those mechanics are acquired in the order, and they're shown in the order that you acquire them in the game. Now, compare and contrast everyone's favorite activity. I am going to be mostly sitting back on this portion of the discussion because the next slide is dedicated entirely to my thoughts and observations. So, what similar elements did you see between the games? And what differences did you see between those elements? I'm studying English literature. So a nice detail is how in Dead Space 1, he's just picking up the tools he finds around that as an engineer he's familiar with, making use of them as he can to survive in contrast to Dead Space 2, where he is now conditioned to treat all his tools in a more lethal way alongside his own increased mobility. He refers to the plasma cutter first as a tissue laser. Nice. Uh, Slar says, again, you have to run away since you're restrained, but the run is much faster and the enemies are more plentiful. A xenomorph gets squished by the door again, but this time Isaac is directly responsible for that since he fights it off and pushes it into said door. Good observation. Usage of stasis is taught on enemies this time rather than objects. Yes, it's actually taught on both, as you'll see. The first play that you show showcased it is slowing down an enemy. And the first game does tell you that you can use stasis to slow down enemies. Uh, that little tooltip that pops up. But the, I gotta stop. I'll get to my, I'll get to my observations. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. It's taught by example, not by trying. Interesting, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, the Necromorph is automatically stasis as part of the cutscene. Although I will say, I, um, I tried hardcore once, that my first hardcore try, um, I didn't stasis the Necromorph again, and he killed me in one shot, and I had to replay 30 minutes, like 45 minutes of the game over from the very beginning, because in hardcore, when you die without saving, uh, you need to watch the opening cutscene again, and it's unskippable. Um, so I've become very cautious in that room as a result. Uh, structure of the intro is almost identical in both games, so the difference in pacing is immediate when controlling Isaac 2. Yeah. Uh, works the same, but it's introduced for the first time via enemy rather than door, but there's a door right after. Yeah, it's, you're, both cases are shown in that example. Anyone else? Again, feel free to raise your hand and say something, even if it's a very small observation. Isaac is also searching for the same tools he had since he's familiar with them. That's an interesting one. I didn't consider that one. Hmm. We are indeed gaming. Anything else before we move on to my personal observations? There's a ton of electronics around, yet he only picks the ones he liked. Uh, he takes the laser off of the surgical ta table rather than just pick it up, like he disassembles it with purpose. Interesting. Writing on a notepad to... Oh, all right. Uh, is going to say something, and then I think we will move on to the next slide. Uh, less, no, text tutorials. The tools are introduced by example, levitating body, surgery cutter. Interesting. Yeah. That's something I also didn't consider. You're sort of shown their direct application outside of a gameplay context as well first. So, oh, how could I forget? This one isn't as important, but it does go to showcase some of the tonal aspects with regards to Isaac's toolkit. So this one is a little bit of an audio mishmash, but we're going to play it real quick. Just the suit-up sequence in the first game and the second game directly compared with one another.
So, time for my observations. This is the part where I talk at you folks for a little bit, as if that isn't what we've been doing the entire time. So, in Dead Space 1, Isaac does not fight back in his first encounter with the Necromorphs. But in Dead Space 2, Isaac cannot fight back in his first encounter. I think, uh, was it uh, Slar that pointed that one out? Um, let's see, who was it? Yeah. It was Slaw that pointed that one out. So he can't fight back in the second game where he is more experienced at dealing with these one, these enemies, right? But in a way, he still managed to do so anyway, right? He shoulders the first one out of the way. And in both games, a necromorph does sort of get gibbed by a door. But in the first one, it's a lucky happenstance that saves Isaac's life. And in the second game, it's an active thing that he causes in order to save himself, Right? So disempowerment versus empowerment. Isaac finds or is given his equipment as he travels through the USG Ishimura, and Isaac scavenges or creates his equipment as he travels through Aegis 7, right? So let's look at the tools on a case-by-case -case basis. So the plasma cutter on the Ishimura is simply waiting there on a bench. In the remake, which is something we'll discuss slightly uh, later on, it's specifically pointed out as you know this plasma cutter repair station but nonetheless it's sitting there waiting for him right whereas in dead space 2 there's a tissue laser laser on a surgery bed which isaac pilfers and then attaches to the flashlight that he acquires earlier to make his own plasma cutter that he can use right uh the stasis module in the first game he finds it just sitting there on the ground in front of a door waiting for him to use whereas in the second game he finds it in a piece of medical equipment, he rips it out of a generator and attaches it to himself so that he can use it. And the most important one, or at least the most interesting one to me, the kinesis module is something that he, again, rips right out of a telekinetic surgery bed, right? And in the first game, it's given to him by this, uh, shall we say, insane and slightly prophetic crew member who then dies immediately afterwards, right? And the important thing is that in Dead Space 2, Kinesis is Isaac's first weapon. This is a later point, but I want to get to it now since it's prevalent. All right? His first weapon in the first game is the Plasma Cutter. And that makes sense given that in the first game, Isaac is very much out of his depth. right? And the tools that he is using, an interesting thing to note about the Dead Space series, are all related to labor in some capacity. The plasma Cutter is not designed as a weapon it is instead a mining tool which isaac will have come in contact and learned how to use during his line of work right and that's not to say that stasis and kinesis are not also regular tools of the job but it is the more traditional weapon of the two however in dead space 2 the first weapon that isaac gets is kinesis right which in the first game as you might have seen during the gameplay showcase at the end of the first little preview is not super great as a weapon in the first game. You saw that I tried to use the Necromorph Claw as a weapon, and while it did do damage, it wasn't nearly as explosive as it is in Dead Space 2. You know, I threw a Necromorph limb at one of their legs, and it went through it and did damage, but didn't seem to have any effect. Whereas in Dead Space 2, it blasts the leg clean off. All right? Now, regarding Stasis and Kinesis, in Dead Space... Stasis and Kinesis are introduced as puzzle-solving tools first and combat resources second. This primarily relates to the examples or the little gameplay scenarios in which you are given them and how you are taught to use the tools. So Stasis in the first game, like you guys noted, you are first introduced in an, enemy, in an area with no enemies whatsoever, and all that's there is this malfunctioning door that you need to slow down so that you can walk through. Very simple puzzle, but one that really efficiently teaches you, hey, this slows things down. And there's a tool tip that says, oh, this can also be used on enemies. But the primary way that the game shows you how to use it is as a puzzle-solving mechanism. And just the same with Kinesis, when you get it, the first thing that you need to do is just clear some heavy boxes out of the way so that you can continue to progress. In contrast, Dead Space 2 first introduces Kinesis in the context of, like I said, your first weapon, right? So the only thing that you have to fend for yourself is Kinesis at the very beginning. 
right? An important thing to note, and something that I do wish I showed off, is that that encounter does not start until you yourself use Kinesis to shatter the windows. And just like I pointed out, uh, you can't break that first fuse box in the first game without shooting it. You can't break the glass in the first encounter of Dead Space 2 unless you throw a sharp object, right? So the game forces you to learn how to use your combat tools before throwing you into an actual combat encounter, right? Now, this is one that you might... Oh, I didn't touch on stasis. Stasis in the second game, also, we, we touched upon this one as well, right? And it is introduced in the context of slowing down an enemy first and then as a puzzle-solving tool. Border, all right. So what do you have to say? Is it the previous comment? Uh, giving you the cutter after Kinesis and then immediately throwing an enemy with claws at you makes the acquiral of the cutter less impactful ammo since it means that you've been given a tool that isn't really necessary for solving the situation. That's, that's fair, yeah. Uh, is the glass the proper type of safety glass for a medical operating theater? That's a really interesting question. I have no idea how to answer. Didn't realize you needed to break the glass first. You're given a weapon in Kinesis and the enemies start coming at you immediately in the same room. Let me read this from uh, Irene. Isaac's stance comes off as more confident in his suit-up, as seen by the use of his movement, specifically the way his hand faces directly towards the camera in the right, but directly avoids it in the left. In the example to the right, his body also seems more relaxed, showing how he feels more conf confident in this environment. Yeah, that's an important thing to consider at least why, why I included the suit-up sequences, is that the first one, Isaac sort of reacts to getting his suit with more of a quiet, uh, how can we say, not quite reassurance or confidence, but it's, it's more of an understated sort of, all right, this will help me. Whereas in the second game, he very much reacts like a duck in water, right? He is you know, stretching, he's feeling out the suit, he's testing all of the features. It's this very, like you said, it's a, it's a superhero moment whenever he suits up. It is this bold moment of very overt empowerment. Whereas in the first game, it is a moment of empowerment in the sense that now you finally have some form of armor to protect you from what's, you know, trying to kill you. But Isaac doesn't react like, oh, I'm, I'm fucking saved, I'm gonna kick some ass now. It's like, all right, now I got a better chance to get out of this shit, right? So, the conclusion, based on those observations, is this. Dead Space 1, Isaac, is helpless and out of his depth, but adaptable. So he happens upon the equipment that he uses during the He uses the equipment primarily as prescribed, or rather, the game teaches you how to use the equipment in the way that it would standardly be used in the setting. And violence is limited to what is strictly necessary. We do have to go back because there's an entire point that is important that I forgot to touch on. I know I need to activate windows. Quit telling me to activate windows. I'm poor, okay? So the important thing that we forgot to discuss is enemies drop resources when killed in Dead Space 1 and enemies drop resources when dismembered after death in Dead Space 2. I did try to showcase this, but it's, it's going to be very difficult to... Notice this one if you haven't played the games yourself, or, you know, I, I wasn't able to, in a very clean or concise way, showcase how the game teaches you these things. So in the first encounter, uh, where Isaac kills the Necromorph, you know, when he first gets the Plasma Cutter, you saw when it died, the ammo just popped out of it immediately on death. I picked it up, reloaded. Whereas in Dead Space 2, after I pinned the Necromorph to the wall with a Kinesis module, I had to punch the one that was strung up, and then I had to stomp the one that was already down, right? And so, in that way, violence becomes a sort of standard language with which Isaac needs to interact with the world in order to survive. Whereas in the previous games, it is enough merely to make sure that the threat is dealt with. In the second game, he not only needs to deal with the threat, he needs to actively, completely destroy it in order to get something from it, right? So... Violence is limited to what is strictly necessary. That is to say that Isaac does not need to resort to dismembering human bodies beyond getting them to stop moving in order to get the resources he needs to survive. In Dead Space 2, however, Isaac is capable, seasoned, and crafty. He pilfers tools from hospital machinery. He uses equipment primarily as a survival tool, as you noted. 
and loud, fast violence has become the default. As you saw with the two standard gameplay previews, as we're going to call them, the first game was a lot slower paced, and the use of mechanics was a lot more uh, subdued. Whereas in the gameplay preview for the second game, it was Kinesis item, take the leg, shoot the arm, grab that, and then continue the cycle, right? And then stomp each one afterwards to get the resources from it. Can you just imagine having to stomp enemies apart for loot in DS1? You did. That is, they, they pop out on death. Dead Space 2 actually plays with your expectations a little bit in this way. There's an enemy, I believe, called the Tripod that when it dies, quote-unquote, will immediately pop out some loot before you kill it completely, right? And that is, in a sense, bait. Like, if you try and actually go up and grab it, it will writhe and do some damage to you, right? So it's playing with your expectations from the previous game in order to, you know, try and trip you up and make you take some damage. So, that's our general conclusions. It is essentially a feeling of empowerment or disempowerment via circumstances versus empowerment via experience, right? So, future considerations. I'm just going to... I didn't play this video when I was showing the little... Uh, you know, lecture format whenever I was doing it for my assignment. But we're just going to watch the very beginning of this video just to get a sense of uh, how the remake is going to deal with certain elements, right? We're just going to, just to be. Do we still have... No? Oh, Discord dying. Hello? Hello? Am I back? Gotcha. Gotcha. I had a feeling the video stopped loading. We're back. Nice. Were you guys able to see the video at all? No. Okay, cool. Let's go back. It's real short. It's rare that a pistol gets to be the star of the show in a video game, but that's exactly what happened in Dead Space. The 2008 survival horror classic made the plasma cutter, a handgun-like tool that shoots vertical or horizontal projectiles, the most essential tool for dismembering your necromorph enemies. When it came to remaking Dead Space, developer Hi, EA Motive knew that it Ooh, had to- Great, awesome, had to fill some dead air in the meantime. I think we're gonna have to mix watching the video because that seems to be triggering something that makes discord dislike me okay so the basic idea is that in the dead space remake isaac puts the plasma cutter together himself rather than just finding it sitting there on the workbench waiting for him to use okay and that's important because for these reasons so the dead space remake has a lot of changes most notable among them is that it gives isaac a voice from the start whereas in the first game he was a silent protagonist and then the second game gained a voice in the dead space remake the narrative is going to say from the jump here's isaac he's a character with a voice that speaks and has motivations that are voiced right and so that allows for more overt narrative characterization rather than the silent characterization that occurred purely through gameplay aspects so it has the potential to characterize him as more capable from the start 
as we see, the IGN video showcases Isaac assembling the plasma cutter himself, already hinting at a more capable sort of personality, or a showcasing of that capable personality that already existed in the first place. However, there are concerns regarding these changes. So, the Dead Space remake also carries over the action elements, the ludic elements rather than the narrative, of previous titles, potentially introducing dissonance where previously there was consonance. So, Isaac's advanced use of Kinesis, for example, could portray him as overly capable of violence. Kinesis in the first game was an available tool, at least in the sense that you could grab necromorph claws or blades or whatever you would like to call them, as I tried to showcase, but it is very much shown to be mostly inefficient and as a last-ditch effort sort of thing, whereas in the second game, it is one of your primary modes of interaction with the enemy. And additionally, needing to stomp bodies for resources could similarly characterize him as overly willing to indulge in violence. That one is not so ironclad, shall we say, because if he does need to stomp the bodies to get the resources, that's merely, you know, doing what you need to survive. However, there is just the visceral brutality of it, of having to stomp those bodies in order to get the resources that may just give him a more violent vibe that he's willing to just do that right from the jump, whereas he didn't need to in the previous game. Uh, I didn't watch Joe playing the remake, no. I played just a little bit of it myself. Um, but I am desperately trying to avoid all possible spoilers. Um, he shoot using the weapons and just gave into violence. That's another thing. Uh, I didn't touch on it a lot during this essay, but Isaac's stomps and punches between the first and second games are very, very different. The first game, his punch is like just a desperate wail. Like he just he just hooks his arm as hard as he possibly can. It's extremely inefficient, right? And likewise, his stomps are also very, very stiff. They're you know, effective if you were to stasis an enemy, but for the most part, like, they have a really slow rhythm to them that just gives them uh, an air of desperation, right? Whereas in the second game, those tools are a lot faster. His punches are a lot more practiced. His stomps can be chained to make them extremely fast, which is definitely a consequence of the action setting and of the action genre influence, right? So... No, 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 don't play it. Don't, no, 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 no. Okay, we're good. We're fine. We're cool. We're cool. Discord didn't, Discord didn't kill us. We're good. We're fine. Thank you for playing. It's, it's a funny joke because it's games is lit. This joke only really works in a text-based format where I am not here to comment. And like I said, do not ask about Dead Space 3. For as far as I am concerned, it does not exist. It doesn't need to exist, and we're not going to talk about it anywhere beyond that. If Jacob Geller doesn't have to talk about it, I don't have to talk about it either. This has been my lecture on Ludo Narrative in the Dead Space series. I hope it was informative, or if nothing else, an enjoyable use of your time. Thank you very much. I probably shouldn't have stopped recording there. I could have done some afterwards discussion. Will this be on the exam? There is no exam. We're not having a final in this class. You're free to go. Cool. Um, oh, wow, you actually did a whole thing. Nice.